The Galloy's restaurant is in a region that adds 10% sales tax onto the price of food and drinks purchased at a restaurant. The prices listed on their menu do not include the sales tax. From the menu, Becky orders a plate of lasagna listed for $7.50, a side salad listed for $5, and lemonade listed for $3. After tax is included, how much is Becky's total bill? Well, they're adding 10%, right? So you first add it up. So you got 7.5 plus 5 plus 3, and then you would add by 1.10, which is... 110 percent so basically 10 percent more than the the amount so this is 1.1 times 15.5 and that is 17.05 will be here total bill once you add the tax a burrito is listed on the menu for six dollars after tax is included what is the greatest number of burritos that jackson can buy if he has fifty dollars okay so He's going to buy, let's say, N burritos. Each burrito is $6. So his total cost would be 6 N. But we also have to add tax. So multiply by that one by one. And we want this to be less than 50, less than or equal to 50. And when you do this math, it basically becomes 6.6 N is less than 50, less than or equal to. And then when you divide through by 6.6, you would get N less than or equal to 7.5. And therefore, the largest number, because we want a whole number, is going to be n equal to 7. So 7 burritos is the most he can buy with his $50. On the Galloy's restaurant menu, hot dogs are listed at a regular price of $5. The restaurant has the following promotional deals. On Monday, if you buy a hot dog at regular menu price of $5, then the second hot dog is for four fifty. On Tuesdays, you pay half the tax on all hot dogs. Chase bought two hot dogs on Monday, two on Tuesday. After tax, determine which day Chase spent less money. So Monday, he spends $5 on the first one, then $4.50 on the second one. And then, of course, we've got to put on the tax. So add, add these two prices and, divide, and then multiply by 1.1, and you'll get 10.45. So that's how much he spent on Monday. Tuesday, he is going to pay regular price, uh, so 5 and 5. So that's the price of the hot dogs, but half the tax. So instead of 1.1, it's 1.05 because it's 5%, not 10% this time. So this calculates to 10.50. So comparing these two, this is the cheaper one. So he spent less money on the Monday. The hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle AOB lies on the line with the equation y is equal to minus 2x plus 12. So figure shown in uh, figure 1. The legs of triangle AOB lie on the axis. What is the area of triangle AOB? Well, let's see here. Uh, this is the equation, right? So I guess we first have to find the intercepts. So when x is 0, that'll be y is 12. So that means this is 12. And when y is 0, you're going to get 0 is equal to minus 2x plus 12. So I believe x will solve to 6. So that means this this 6 right there. So the triangle has the area of 1 half base times height. The base from here to here is 6. The height from there to there is 12. So that's basically the area. And of course, i got to do the math there, and that's 36. Part B. A second line passes through and is perpendicular to the first line, as shown in figure 2. The two lines intersect at C. Determine the coordinates of C. Okay, so this line here, that one that goes through O and C, is perpendicular to the one that goes through A and B, right? So if two lines are perpendicular, their slopes are negative reciprocals. You guys remember that, right? Negative reciprocals brocals two lines that are perpendicular so this line here has a slope of minus two you can get that from the equation so the other line the negative reciprocal of that is a half right reciprocal you just flip it and then take the negative so so that means this line the one that goes through OC has a slope of a half okay so now you just got to figure out the equation and then we'll figure out the coordinates so the equation is y equals mx plus b of any line. Now we just concluded that the m, the slope, is a half. 
And then the point zero goes through that line, so that point is zero, zero. If you sub that into this equation, you will get that b is zero. So therefore, the equation is just y is equal to x over two. That's the equation of that line that goes through O and C. So to find the coordinates of C, we just have to make these two lines equal to each other, this line and this line. So the other line was what? Mine is equal 2x plus 12, right? So let's set, set them equal to each other. Set them equal to each other. And we will get this equation. Multiply through by 2. We get x is equal to minus 4x plus 24. So 5x is 24. And therefore, x to me looks like 24 over 5. Yeah. And then sub that back into either one, and we get the y-coordinate. And that'll give you y is equal to 24 over 10, which is 12 over 5, I believe. Yeah. So that means C, the coordinates of C are 24 over 5 and 12 over 5. Yeah. Part C, the second line passes through the point D in the first quadrant as shown in figure 3. The points E and F are positioned on the axis so that DEOF is a rectangle. If the area of DEOF is 1352, determine the coordinates of D. Okay. Well, this line right here, we have already figured out the equation. It's y is equal to x over 2. So therefore, this point D, since it's on that line, it is of the form x y, but y is equal to x over 2. Got it? So that means from here to here is x, and from here to here is x over 2. Now the area of a rectangle is length times width, so that would be x uh, times x over 2. That would be the area of that rectangle. Um, what do they call it? D-E-O-F? Yeah. And they tell me in that question that that's equal to 1, 3, 5, 2. So there you go. That's the algebra. So this is going to be x squared is equal to 2, 7, 0, 4. And then when you take the square root, you get a nice little number, 52. So we want the coordinates of d. So d would be 52 and 52 over 2, which is 26. And there you go. If n is a positive integer, the notation n exclamation mark, read n factorial, is used to represent the product of the integers from 1 to n. That is, n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 times 3 times 2 times 1. For example, n 5 factorial would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 or 120. What is the largest positive integer m for which 2 to the power of m is a divisor of 9 factorial? Okay. So first, what is 9 factorial? It is, of course, 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Now, instead of these numbers, let's write them in prime factors. So 9 is 3 squared, 8 is 2 to the power of 3, 7 is 2 times 3 for the 6, 5, 2 squared for the 4, 3, 2, 1. And then let's combine these. But I really only care about the powers of 2. So this is going to give me 3, another one, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So 2 to the power of 7, and then a whole bunch of stuff that I don't, that I don't care about. So that means that 9 factorial is 2 to the power of 7 times something else. So the largest divisor of 9 factorial in terms of powers of 2 is this 2 to the power of 7. And they're saying that it's represented by 2 to the power of m, so that means that m is 7. So hopefully that makes sense. What is the smallest value of n for which n factorial is divisible by 7 squared? Okay, 7 squared. So a little bit different this time. So we want the smallest value such that this n factorial has some 7 squared in it and then a whole bunch of stuff that we don't care about. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. There's no 7s yet, but we got a 7 there. So that gives me a power of 1, but we need two powers. 8, 9, keep going here, see if we can get a 7. 14. 14 will give me a 7 because 14 is 2 times 7, right? So I think that's I think that's it. I think that's pretty much it. So if you have 14 factorial, this is going to have 
this 7 and then that 7. That will give you the 7 to the power of 2 and then a whole bunch of stuff that we don't care about. So I guess the answer to this question is n is 14 because they want the smallest. That's the key thing there is that we want the smallest. There's others, of course, many infinite uh, values of n, but um, I think n equals 14 would be the smallest. Explain why there is no positive integer n for which n factorial is divisible by 7 to the power of 7, but is not divisible by 7 to the power of 8. Okay. So let's see here. Something factorial, uh, well, we don't know what it is, but 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. Okay, we get to 7. Okay, we got a 7. And instead of writing them all out, I'm just going to write the, the multiples of 7. We got 14, which is 2 to the 2 times 7, so we're going to have another 7 from there. 21, that will give me another 7, because that's 3 times 7. 28 is 4 times 7. 35 is 5 times 7. 42 is 6 times 7. And finally, 49 is actually 7 squared. Okay, so let's stop right there, like right before the 49. Everything... Uh, so for every n less than 49, so 48, 40, and so on, n factorial uh, will not be divisible by 7 to the power of 7. Because up until that, how many 7s do we have? We had 1 here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we haven't gotten to the 7 to the power of 7. If we go, if you choose like any number, let's say we chose 48, it'll be divisible by 7 to the power of 6. So divisible by 7 to the power of 6. But we haven't reached that 7th 7 yet. So I think this is an accurate statement. Now, once we get to 49, for every n greater than or equal to 49, now, n factorial will be divisible by 7 to the power of 7. But it will also, also be divisible by 7 to the power of 8. Why? Because this 49 gives us two more. We, we immediately go from 7 to the power of 6 to 7 to the power of 8. We, we, we add 2 in one number. So that means that every number is going to be divisible by both, every number greater than 49, greater than or equal to 49, is going to be divisible by both 7 to the power of 7 and 7 to the power of 8. So what they're asking is, show that there's no positive integer that n factorial is divisible by 7 to the power of 7, but is not divisible by 7 to the power of 8. Well, there's no such thing, because they're going to be divisible by both. Uh, they're going to be divisible by both 7 to the power of 7 and 7 to the power of 8. So uh, you can explain that in words however you want. Show that there is exactly one positive integer n for which n factorial is equal to 2 to the power of a, 3 to the power of b, 5 to the power of c, 7 to the power of d, times 11 squared, 13 squared, 17, 19, 23, and a plus b plus c plus d is 45. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, hmm, try to get prime factorization, but I got to go up pretty high. Now, this is very, very key here, very important, uh, what they've given us here. They already broke it up into prime factorization, so it's very nice. And therefore, when I, when I try to figure this out, it makes my life easier because I know I've got to go up to at least 23. So let me just make a list first and come back. Okay, so I went as high as 30 uh, because I know i got to go as high as 23 to figure out what n is because there's a 23 in there. And then, as before, i got to break these numbers up into their prime factorization. So that will make my life easier. Okay, that's just 1, 2, 3. This is 2 squared. 5, 2 times 3, 7, 2 to the power of 3, 3 squared, 5 times 2. That's 11. What's 12? Uh, boy, 2 to the power of 2 times 3. That's 13. That's 2 times 7. 3 times 5. 
2 to the power of 4. 17, 3 squared times 2, 19, 2 squared times 5, 3 times 7, 2 times 11, 23. And I'm going to stop there uh, for now because I think I, I might need to include more, but let me just stop there. Let me combine all of that. Okay, so I've got to combine this without making mi any mistakes. So let's see here. Okay, so 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, 2 to the power of 19. Okay, but so far so good. Now let's count the threes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's 3 to the power of 9. Okay, next prime number would be 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 4. Okay, next prime number is 7. 1, 2, 3. So 3 there. And then the rest, it should, let's see here, 1, 2, 11 to the power of 2. And then 13, 1 there. Hold on, 13, I only have th one 13 so far, okay. Anything else? I got a 17, I got a 19, and I got a 23. 17, a 19, and I got a 23. Okay, so let me s compare it to this here. Well, these guys we'll talk about a little bit later, but let me just look at that one there. That one matches. The 13 doesn't match because this is power of 1. I need a power of 2, so... But the 17 and 19 and 23, those match. Okay, so I'm doing pretty good. I just need to get one more 13. Okay, so if I need one more 13, I'm going to have to go up to 26 because that's the only way. Because that's what, 2 times 13? Yeah, so this is 5 times 5. And 24 is what, uh, 8 times 3. So 3 times 2 to the power of 3. So I've got to add these guys. Okay, let's add them. So that gives me another 4, uh, 2. So this becomes 2 to the power of 23 now. For 3, I get 1 more 3. So that becomes 3 to the power of 10. For 5, I get 2 more 5s. So that becomes 5 to the power of 6. 7 remains power of 3. The 11 remains. And then I got a 13. So great. I finally was able to match that. And then the rest stays the same. So this is all matched up with this original guy right here that and then now we got to talk about this with that condition okay all right i think i got it so let me see what is a plus b plus c plus d right now we're supposed to make it 45 but right now we have the following 23 plus 10 plus 6 plus 3 and that's what 33 plus 9 which is 42 okay i'm pretty close I got to make it 45. Okay, so that means I got to add one more. Let's see if I add this 27. What is that? 3 to the power of 3, right? If I add that, this becomes now 2 to the power of 23, 3 to the power of 13, 5 to the power of 6, 7 to the power of 3, and then the rest, of course, remains the same. And I'm pretty sure this will do it because now my A plus B plus C plus D is uh, 23 plus 13 plus 6 plus 3, and that is indeed 45. Yeah, 36 plus 9. Okay, there, I got it. So that means my A was 23. Not that they asked for this, but just for the sake of completion. And then D is 3. And then what are they asking? Uh, only one positive integer, N. Ah, okay, what is N factorial? Well, I got up to 27, so it's 27 factorial. Yeah. Yeah, so th this right here, right? 27 factorial. Okay, great. So a very nice question. Let me put that in there. N is 27. A positive integer N is digit balanced if each digit D with D between 0 and 9 inclusive appears at most D times in the integer. 
For example, 13224 is digit balanced, but 21232 is not. Explain why a digit balanced integer is not divisible by 10. If an integer is divisible by 10, whatever it is, the last digit will be a 0. Correct? Now, this immediately fails to comply with the definition because if there's a 0 in there, that fails the condition because according to the definition, 0 would have to appear at most 0 times. So I guess if you translate that into, um, into understandable language, basically what that means is that 0 cannot be in the number if you want it to be digit balanced. Well, 0 is in the number if it's, if it's divisible by 10. So therefore, we can't have any digit balanced number that's divisible by 10. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, moving right along. How many four-digit integers have all non-zero digits and are not digit balanced? Are not digit balanced. Okay, well, our four-digit number can be of the following form. It could be four numbers that are exactly the same, or it could be three that are the same and one different, or two that are the same and two that are the same, or two same, one different, one different, or all four different, like that. Got it? So here we have four of the same, three in a one situation, two and two situation, a two, one, one situation, and a one, 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 one situation, okay? And of course, they're all non-zero, and we have to see if they are not digit balanced. So not digit balanced. That's, I guess, our criteria, okay? Yeah, not digit balanced. Okay, so the first one is not digit balanced if if that number x is equal to 1 or 2 or 3. Because you just go back to the original definition, 1 can only appear as um, at most one time. 2 can only appear uh, twice, and 3 can only appear three times. But if you want a digit to appear four times, it's got to be at least a 4. So if you chose x to equal to equal either one or two or three, it would not be digit balanced. So now I got to figure out how many of those are there. Okay. So that means I think one 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 that kind of a number two 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 three 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 three. So that's a grand total of three. Uh, so the the total number of such integers is three for this first case. Now I'm not going to be able to list all of them because I'm a, I think this number is going to get much bigger but for this I just listed them because there's only three. Okay moving right along. The next one would not be digit balanced if x is equal to one or two for the same kind of story same definition right? Okay so that means now I'm not going to list them because this is going to be a lot but we got to talk about this. If x is one that means f of these four, we're going to choose uh, one spot uh, for the Y. Yeah, because the Y could be in this position, this position, this position, or this position. So first I got to choose one position for the Y. And then for the X, there are how many choices? Uh, the digits are 1 through 9. Uh, the digits... Yeah, the digits are 1 through 9 because you can't have zeros, and the 1 has already been chosen for the x, so y can be anywhere from 2 to 9, correct? So that means there's 8 choices for the y. Because the x has already been set. So this is 4 times 8 is 32. So there's 32 possible ways of making this number 
if x is 1, and then y can be anything between 2 and 9. And then if x is 2, if x is 2, I think it's the same story. So if x is 2, again, you choose 1. For, from 4, you have to choose 1 spot for that y. And then that y has 8 possible choices. Uh, and the x is fixed as 2. So again, 32. So we add this 32 and that 32, so we get 64 there. All right, I think that makes sense. Okay, moving along to this guy. This is not digit balanced if x is equal to 1. Yeah. So again, uh, from the 4, we have to choose two spots for that x, right? Because it, it could be any of those four spots. And the... Huh. Hmm. And, uh, well, this is this scenario is that I'm calculating is for x equals 1, right? And uh, y, obviously, we're going to have to have something other than 1. So x is always fixed as 1, and we have to choose 4. From the 4 spots, we have to choose 2 for that x. And for the y, it's going to be something other than 1. So we have 8 choices, just like we had before, because y can be anything from 2 to 9. And I think that's it. So this is going to be 6 times 8, which is 48. So I think, yeah, th that's it, right? Yeah, because it's interchangeable. Because it also is not digit balanced if y is equal to 1. But if y is equal to 1, then x is not equal to 1. So it's the same kind of thing, I think. Yeah, this is unique. This 48 that I just figured out is unique. Because if you use like y equals 1 and x does not equal 1, you're going to get the same numbers. Yeah, you're going to get doubles basically. So that's why I, I only have to calculate it once. Okay, moving right along. This guy, uh, I think I might have even wrote this wrong here. Sorry about that. It, I think it's x, x, y, z. Yeah, that should be a z. Okay, because otherwise it's the same as this. Okay, so this one is not digit balanced if x is equal to 1, I believe. Yeah. So again, same story. From those four spots, we got to choose 2 for the x. And for the y, we're going to have 8 choices. And for the z, we're going to have 7 choices. So this will be 6 times 8 times 7, which I believe is 336. Okay. And then now this last guy, uh, this is always digit balanced. Uh, always digit balanced. Since no matter what you make the numbers, there's it's always going to satisfy the criteria since no one integer appears more than once. So zero here. So I guess you just add up these four guys and you get the final answer. So 3 plus 64 plus 48 plus 336, and that is 451. And that solves this question.